Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday, December 15th. Happy Hump Day. You're watching News 3 now. We're halfway through another week. We're inching closer and closer to December 25th. Yes, Christmas is less than two weeks away, y'all. We're almost there. We almost made it to the holidays. We can see our families and celebrate, eat good food again. <sighs> We're almost there. The weather, not super December-like yet could be a little bit better into the weekend. So for the rest of the work week, we're gonna see weather just like this, but we're fingers crossed, we're gonna see a little bit of a cold front coming in this weekend. Well, hey, we're gonna start with something cool today and about every month or so, I head on down the street to the Brazos Valley Council of Governments because they have, and when I say plethora, I mean a plethora of resources and programs and organizations here to help make a difference in the lives of us here in the community in the Brazos Valley. And every month or so, I try to highlight an organization, a program or two. Today we're getting lucky and we're gonna talk about two. So first thing we're gonna talk about is the Aging and Disability Resource Center or the ADRC. Now, the Brazos Valley Aging and Disability Resource Center works with the aged or those over 60 and disabled community by providing information about services and support to help individuals and families make informed choices about health and wellness. So this morning I got to sit down with Hank and talk a little bit more about those resources. Check it out. So Hank, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I'm very excited to talk to you and let's talk about the Aging and Disability Resource Center. For people who don't know or maybe you're new to the area like I am, tell us about what y'all do. Well, we're a resource for people who are over 60 years old or disabled individuals for the whole seven county area. Bryan College Station certainly, but all the counties that touch Brazos County. And what we do is pair people up with things that they might need. Uh, home meals, home delivered meals, assistance with figuring out Medicare, questions about that, uh, questions about Social Security. And, and while there are resources in town where you can get a phone number and they'll send you on someplace, what we do is actually kind of hold people's hands and walk them through the system a little bit so that they're comfortable because what we found is even if it's on the website for somebody or they can get it on their smartphone, a lot of the people who call us not only don't have computer access, they don't have a smartphone, maybe they have a flip phone, but a lot of stuff they do, they're calling us from their home line. And so we help them understand things that to other people might be easier to find, but to that particular group are kind of overcoming. You know, Hank, I think aging is a very tough topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. I think that for a lot of families, it's hard to decide when it's time to get that help. What do you recommend, what advice do you have for elderly people, for disabled people, or their family members who are like, I think it might be time to get help, but we're not really sure? I think the key thing is never be embarrassed. Never think, oh, well, they're going to ask me how much money I make, or oh, I probably make too much money for this program or that program because we're gonna know the answers to those kinds of questions. We're also gonna be able to tell them how to find the best facility, if a facility is necessary, for their family member, regardless of their situation. I mean, if they need to lock down one because somebody has dementia, or if they just need basic care, or somebody to come in the house a little, few times a week to help them out a little bit, we know about all that kind of stuff. Um, plus, we can help them find transportation to get to the doctor, um, meals to come to their home if they're not able to prepare their meals like they used to be able to or just can't afford their groceries. We can help them with that. So I, I just think never think, oh, it's too early, because it's never really too early to start asking questions. So just know to have a plan in your back pocket to say, here's what we're going to do when mom does need that kind of help. We're happy to help you plan ahead, and if you've got an emergency, we can usually help you figure out what's going on right now and, and help find some quick resources, too. And so you had mentioned just briefly some of the resources that you're able to connect people with. Let's talk a little bit more specifically about those resources. I mean, like you mentioned, meals coming to mm -hmm. your home, maybe. What are some other ones? We have a couple of 300 partners that we deal with in the whole community that, um, like one specific one what might provide transportation they've got volunteers and they've got vans and they'll get people around um, we do have a transit system but sometimes it takes a while these people will actually take you from your home directly to the doctor instead of having to make stops along the way and can accommodate people in wheelchairs and things um, other organizations might be able to provide a loaner wheelchair or a bed long term um, 
even adult diapers or things like that for free. Um, we also have organizations that can help with food. Obviously, the food bank does that, but um, we help them get in touch if they need that kind of thing. Plus, and we hate these kind of phone calls, but they do come up. Um, senior abuse is more of an issue than we'd like it to be. Um, and so we can help people deal with what to do if we think somebody has taken something from mom or we think somebody has hurt our next door neighbor or something like that. We can help them get those people help immediately um, and, and refer them right to the right people. And in some cases, hook them up with the exact person and exact name of someone who we know at that organization so that they can help them in, in a variety of situations that might come up for anybody, but especially population over 60 and the disabled individuals. So if someone does want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to go about that? Are they to come here? Do they call you? What's the best way? We will do anything anyone wants to. Uh, our offices are open 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Someone's always there, even during lunch. So walking in is fine. Um, our phone number is 979-595-2831. That rings right into my offices um, with myself and another individual. Or they can email us at adrc at bvcog. Org, um, we'll help them any way we can. It doesn't matter to us. Uh, our goal is if somebody have, does have to leave a message, we call them back within an hour or so. Um, we try to get back to them very quickly, but we want to help any way they need it. And so, Hank, my last question is actually going off of what you just said. You know, you handed me this flyer. I've been reading over it. It talks a lot about stuff that you guys are all about, right? Some of your mantras, some of, you know, your goals. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. Well, I, th I think, as I said, there are ways to call and get a phone number for something. There are not a lot of resources, especially for older individuals, for people who understand the barriers, like I mentioned earlier, the technology barriers and stuff. Somebody who takes kind of a compassionate approach and doesn't just think, oh, I answered the phone and it's client number 123655. This is Mrs. Smith in Leon County, and here's what she needs. And, oh, Mrs. Smith, did you ever think about this? in addition to what you're calling about? Mm -hmm. Because we know in some cases, like if they've got meal issues, they might need utility assistance because they've got financial issues or they not, might need rental assistance or something like that. So we kind of help them think through everything. Um, especially with Medicare, um, we just finished up Medicare sign up time. And you see all the ads with Joe Namath and right. Jimmy Walker. Well, a lot of people think that they actually are representing Medicare but they're not. They're representing private insurance companies who, when you call that 800 number, in some cases will sell you pretty much anything they can get to sell you, whether it's really for you or not. So we help people say, be able to look at plans and different things like that and say, here's the best one for me, not just because Joe Namath said it, but because this meets my situation with my drugs that I need, the doctors I want to see, and it helps my budget. Um, and, and in some cases, people don't even realize with Medicare, there's a premium that people pay for the doctor part of it, we can help them find ways based on their income to not even have to pay that. And nobody knows about that kind of stuff. So we're hopefully, as much as we can be, the local expert on senior issues to help people find the assistance that they can need and, and that will help them live a longer, healthier life. Because a lot of the funding that we get is based around helping people live in their homes longer on their own instead of having to go to the nursing home or having to do this. So we do everything we can to make that happen. Well, Hank, it sounds like you guys are doing a great job. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation so more people can be exposed to what you guys do, the resources that you provide. Anything else you want people to know? No, I, you know, we've got our contact information. It's on here, and I put it on the, I talked about it a minute ago. We're just here to help, and we're happy to help anyone who needs it. Awesome. Well, Hank, thank you so much. Thank you. So you can find more information on the Brazos Valley Council of Governments website or you can just directly look for the Aging and Disability Resource Center of the Brazos Valley. And one more service that's provided over at BVCOG that I want to talk about today is this new Service Industry Recovery Child Care Program, or SIR, S-I-R. So the SIR program is for parents that are working in the arts, entertainment, recreation, food services, retail. The SIR program is intended to provide parents with one year of free child care. Of course, those who were laid off maybe during the pandemic and are having trouble affording health care as they want, or excuse me, child care as they want to go back to work now. Well, this is the program for them. So I got to sit down this morning with Latrizia, who helps out with the child care program over at BBCOG and Workforce Solutions. 
Well, Tricia, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And we're talking about something incredibly important all the time, not just right now during the pandemic. Let's talk a little bit about the child care program that y'all have here, the resources that you provide. Yes, ma'am. Uh, with the child care program, uh, we are currently experiencing a wait list. However, um, we hope that everybody applies for the wait list because what we do um, each month, we go on and see if we're able to fund um, some additional slots um, to qualify for the program, you have to be working or attending training for at least 25 hours a week. And basically, what the child care program does, it assists uh, the parents uh, with uh, their parents' share of cost. So it's a subsidized program. So it's based on the household size and the income limits. And so what that does, what, what my workers does, they go in and look at the the eligibility to see exactly what parent share of costs will be assigned to that family. So it can parent share of costs can range from um, zero dollars a month up into two hundred a month. So it just basically depends. Um, however, um, T Texas Workforce Commission uh, uh, d did uh, create a, an initiative of the job search, um, meaning that our program you have to be working or attending school. Um, so with the pandemic and everything that was going on July the 1st of 2021, uh, Texas Workforce Commission sent out a directive for us to assist the parents that were having a hard time that were laid off mm -hmm. um, with a job search. So if they came into the program and they was not employed, we were able to give them three free months of child care and assist them with finding employment or enrolling in some type of training. Well, that's great. And I think stuff like this, you know, it's hard to talk about. It's hard to know that you need to reach out for help. And then it's hard to reach out for help even if you know that you need help. What advice would you have for parents or families who are struggling? They need child care, but maybe they're a little bit embarrassed about that. Yes, ma'am. And, and really, um, the child care limits, uh, the income limits for our uh, uh, applicants are very high. It's not just for low-income families. Mm -hmm. A family of two can make up to $48,000 a year. So it's not just strictly based on, uh, you know, you have to be receiving public assistance to qualify for this program. And there is help out there. And also, um, we just ask everyone to come in if they have any questions to contact us and we can walk them through it. And so we talked a little bit about this new initiative by the Texas workforce because of the pandemic, because a lot of people were being laid off, a lot of people needed help looking for jobs. And we know that one of the hardest hit industries was a service industry. Yes, ma'am, it was. So talk and, to me about that. Yes, and so Workforce Solutions Rises Valley is pleased to announce that we have a new service industry recovery child care program. And what the um, Texas Workforce Commission does, Texas got a total of $500 million to to launch this program. And so Brazos Valley were, was sent funding uh, for uh, to fund a total of 603 children in our area. And so what we're doing, um, and it's specifically for the service industry, being that they were the hardest hit, mm -hmm. and also assisting the employers with you know, finding, retaining some of the employees because they're struggling for childcare and they need childcare. Childcare is very expensive. And so this program, helps with a year free child care okay and there's no cost to them mm -hmm. and so what we're doing is uh, we're launching a ser service industry roundup that will begin on january the 5th and we will extend our office hours on wednesdays to 8 p.m to assist and be here for the customers that that, that doesn't uh, works the non-traditional hours mm -hmm. everybody in the service industry we know that does not work uh, right. nine to five. Right. So we're going to be here for those individuals. Wow. And so um, I just want everybody to come out. If, if they have any questions, I, I want them to reach out to us. So when we talk about the service industry, who does that include? Um, that includes the arts, the entertainment, the recreation. Um, it also uh, includes food and accommodations and retail trade. So your hotels, your uh, movie theaters, your bowling alleys, your gyms that you go out and work out in, um, your golf, your clubs, your golf clubs, and, mm -hmm. and those different businesses. Okay. And so if someone sees this interview today, they think, that's me. I need assistance. How can they go about applying, getting in touch with you? Yes. Um, they can visit our website of uh, the BB jobs.org and 
we have um, the applications there in English and Spanish. Also, we have an electronic application where it will take less than five minutes for them to complete, and, and it comes straight to us. And they can also contact us at ccms at bvcog.org, and they will, we will be able to assist them through it. And then those extra business hours, one more time, when are they starting? Um, they will be starting on January the 5th. Okay. We will be extending the hours to 8 p.m. on Wednesdays to awesome. be here. Perfect. Okay, and so any other things that you want people to know are just about regular child care program or about the specific service industry? Oh, well, I would like to include that not only we are helping our customers, we are also helping our providers. Um, the Texas Workforce Commission did send an extra uh, 164, it's 164 million for um, Texas and so what that's going to do that's going to be the growth supplemental payments that the providers will be getting a uh, 20% um, each month uh, up until June and then what we'll do we'll go back and review the data and everything and extend the program to September the 22nd and so what this is doing is allowing our daycares to uh, get that additional assistance because as you know a lot of individuals did not return back to work um, during the pandemic and so they're struggling with um, the retention of staff and finding staff you know and so also we um, the Texas Workforce Commission um, have launched another second round of grants um, that will start in um, year 2022 and so what's going to happen with that the providers are going to be able to apply for those grants. There are going to be certain stipulations and eligibility criteria that they have to meet, but it will assist them and they will not have to pay that money back. So it's going to help them with um, operational costs, uh, staff retention bonuses, and all of that good stuff. So there's definitely help. It's definitely a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like Yes, ma'am. It well, is. Awesome. awesome. Well, anything else that you want people to know? No, I just want everybody to come in. If they have any questions about this new service industry program, please come in. The slots are filling up really fast, and we need to service our children here in the Brazos Valley. Well, great. Thank you so much. And I'm going to put this up on our website later, and I'll link that to you. So if anyone has questions, I'm sending them right to you. Have them, have them come in. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Like I said, Brazos Valley Council of Governments has so many resources, programs, things to help everyone out in the community. So go give them a visit. They're right down the street from us here on East 29th Street in Bryan. They're awesome. They're friendly. They want to help. That's what I've gathered from every person that I've met so far, which is quite a few over at BBCOG. They are really passionate about what they do. They want to serve you, me, the entire community. They want to help and they have the resources to do so. They have the funding to do so. I remember the first time I met them, they said, thanks for you know spreading the word because we have what we need, but now we need people to give that to. They have the resources, the funding. If you need help, go see the team at Brazos Valley Council of Governments. All right, y'all, getting into some national coverage now. President Biden is actually just landed in Kentucky to survey the damage from the tornado that left at least 74 people dead and more than 100 others unaccounted for. One of the youngest victims was three-year-old Jaleel Dunbar. Now his mother shares her heartbreak with CBS News lead national correspondent David Bagnaugh, who has this report from Mayfield, Kentucky. It was perfect. I didn't always think so, but <laughs> he was. He was one of a kind. That is what Huda Alubahi wanted us to know about her three-year-old son, Jaleel. Last Friday night, the unthinkable happened. Alubahi was sitting in the living room with Jaleel and his little brother, Julius, when she got an alert on her phone. Tornado warning. I heard the alarm go off on my phone and the power went out. And my three-year-old, he said, um, Mommy, I'm scared. As soon as I heard kind of like train noises, I grabbed both of them and just jumped into the closet in the bathroom. By that time, everything was just falling on top of us. That storm shredded Alubahi's home, bringing the upper floors crashing down on top of her and her babies. I was under there somewhere. They were penned underneath the rubble. I think it was the sink or the toilet. That's what landed on my face right there. 
Where were the babies? Right here. One, one was in this arm and one was in this arm. Uh, I never saw my three-year-old because my face couldn't turn that way, but I did see the baby, um, and he uh, cried, and then he just stopped. So um, at that time, I thought he was sick. Uh, gone, but he wasn't. I never heard my three-year-old say anything. Did Jalil die in your arms? Did. I'm so sorry. It was actually her youngest son's screams that helped Alubahi's brother to find them in the rubble. One-year-old Julius was rescued first, and he was untouched by the debris. I didn't know my three-year-old um, was gone until later that night, so I never saw him at all. How did you find out? Their dad came um, when I was in the hospital, and he told me. I wish I could have saved my son. <laughs> the tornado that destroyed Huda's home also wiped out the homes of her aunt and her mother. Now, Huda has three older children. They were not here at the time of the tornado. They were staying with their dad, but just about five minutes down the road, the tornado never touched their home. David Begno, CBS News, on the ground here in downtown Mayfield, Kentucky. Well, Jaleel was one of at least 12 children who died in that storm in Kentucky. And like I said, President Biden is in Mayfield, Kentucky as we speak. There's a live feed up right now of him kind of getting some remarks, some debrief from some of the officials down in Kentucky right now. We're going to go there live for just a couple of minutes. Partly on Chesapeake Bay as well as... Uh on the Delaware River and the Atlantic Ocean, we got a lot of storms. But nothing like we've seen the tornado that came through here. But um, the main thing I want to say is I'm amazed. I've been asking my FEMA people, folks and, and, and uh, my uh, Homeland Security, what, what is the most impressive thing you've seen? I meant in terms of, I started off thinking in damage. And they said, the way you all come together, the way people just come out of nowhere to help as a community. And uh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's, uh, that's, that's what America's supposed to be. There's no uh, red tornadoes or blue tornadoes. There's no red states or blue states when this stuff starts to happen. And uh, I think, uh, at least in my experience, uh, it either brings people together or really knocks them apart. And they're moving you together here. It's, uh, but look, one thing I'll say, and I'll, but I want to hear from all of you, is that, um, and I know the governor and the former governor have been through this before, but uh, immediately after disaster is a time when people are really, really moving and trying to help each other and trying to get things done. But after uh, a month, after six weeks, after two months, people are... Uh, can get themselves to the point where they get fairly depressed about what's going on. Well, like you can see there, the feed is not very clean from Kentucky, so we're going to kind of just pop in and out of that as the president continues speaking and talking over things with some of the officials down there in Kentucky as he surveys the damage and meets with some community members. This is something that I saw online that I wanted to share with y'all. This is crazy. It's the moment that first responders found a fully intact American flag underneath all of the rubble that used to be Mayfield, Kentucky's city courthouse. Check this out. Yeah. There we go. Grab the poles. There you go. Awesome. 
I just thought that was really powerful and a true testament to the American spirit. Well, some breaking news this morning. It's now up to the Justice Department to decide whether to pursue criminal charges against former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. The House voted to find Meadows in contempt of Congress late last night. The January 6th panel recommended holding Meadows in contempt for failing to appear despite subpoena. Well, the D.C. Attorney General is suing more than two dozen members of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers in connection with the Capitol insurrection. The lawsuit describes the actions of the groups as, quote, a coordinated act of domestic terrorism. The suit also accuses the group's leaders of recruiting members to travel to the Capitol, providing them with weapons and conducting training. The lawsuit seeks to recoup millions of dollars the city spent to defend the Capitol during the attack. The Georgia man who threatened to kill House Speaker Nancy Pelosi will spend the next year and a half in prison. Though he didn't attend the January 6th siege due to car trouble, he sent a text to a friend saying he was thinking about shooting Pelosi in the head on live television. His mom is the one who turned him in. Meredith pleaded guilty to sending those threatening communications earlier this year. Well, soon the Capitol Police will be able to directly request assistance from the National Guard. That bill is headed to the president's desk. The House and Senate unanimously passed the bill yesterday. Previously, consent from the Capitol Police Board was required for this kind of backup. And the House lawmakers are one step closer to getting their hands on former President Donald Trump's tax returns. A federal judge, a Trump appointee, is rejecting Mr. Trump's bid to stop the Justice Department from handing the documents over to the House Ways and Means Committee. The committee says the tax returns may reveal potentially improper business dealings. Dealings, they say, could have affected his execution of presidential powers. The former president has two weeks to appeal. And with just hours to spare, a bill that will prevent the nation from defaulting on its debts is on its way to the president's desk. The House voted to raise the debt ceiling by two and a half trillion dollars late last night. It came in just in time because the Treasury Secretary, as we know, warned that the U.S. could reach its debt limit today. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said the new debt limit will extend into 2023. The issue will not have to be addressed again until after next year's midterm elections. Well, final data on Pfizer's experimental treatment for COVID-19 has now been shared with the FDA as part of the company's application to authorize the pill for emergency use. Mandy Gaither has a look at those results. If authorized, this pill could be another tool in the fight against COVID-19. Pfizer says updated results show the treatment cut the risk of hospitalization or death by 89% if given to high-risk adults within a few days of first symptoms. The pill is potentially a lifesaver for everyone. Pfizer hopes to offer the pills under the name Paxlovid for people to take at home before they're sick enough to go to the hospital. When we have peaks of this uh, disease, when we have the waves that are coming, the hospitals are really over, over uh, crowded, and that creates significant issues to the healthcare system. Right with this pill, we are expecting that instead of 10 people going to the hospital, only one will go, and actually no one is dying. The company says it expects the drug to retain activity against variants like Omicron, and it appears to do so in lab tests because the drug blocks an enzyme involved in viral replication. But 
Pfizer CEO wants to make it clear the pill treats COVID-19 but doesn't prevent it. Vaccines are needed. Vaccines is the primary frontier that we should be using to stop the disease. If the FDA grants emergency use authorization, Pfizer says the pill could be available in the U.S. this month. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Well, no date has been set yet by the FDA advisory committee that's expected to weigh in on the treatment. A new study suggests it's likely that you and I have both had COVID-19 and just not known it yet. Researchers determined about 40% of COVID cases are actually asymptomatic. And of course, we know by now that the big problem is asymptomatic people can still pass the virus to others. The study found asymptomatic infections are most common in pregnant women, air or cruise travelers, and nursing home residents and staff. And there's another new study that says that vaccines have prevented more than 1 million COVID deaths in the United States. Most of those deaths would have happened in the late summer and early fall. Researchers say during that time, average daily deaths could have spiked as high as 21,000 per day. And this is something that happened last night that I want to share with y'all. and House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy in a moment of silence in remembrance of the more than 800,000 American lives lost to the COVID-19 virus. Well, so what that was, members of Congress held a moment of silence last night at the U.S. Capitol in remembrance of the 800,000 Americans who have died of COVID-19. Well, let's pop on over now to our COVID-19 dashboard and take a look at some of the numbers here in the Brazos County today. You and I are seeing these numbers at the same time as they're reported by the Health District. So let's go over them. Hospitalizations remain the same with four Brazos County residents hospitalized for COVID-19. Those hospitalizations making up 1.56% of all hospitalizations in Brazos County. No new deaths being reported by the health district, but our active cases are rising once again. Now we're pretty, uh, I don't want to say well over 200, but 229 is not as good as it looked just a week ago when we were hovering underneath that 200 mark. Now we're pretty well above it with 229 active cases here in Brazos County. Well, hey, here's a pretty cool story. A Texas A&M researcher has developed a new method for identifying the source of lead poisoning in children. Traditionally, researchers tell us it was assumed that sources of lead poisoning came from things with higher concentrations of lead. Well, this new methodology uses lead isotopes to more accurately identify the actual source. The lead isotope in a potential source is matched with the amount of lead isotope found in a blood sample. I was able to uh, try to see which was the most likely source. Lead isotopes can be used as a fingerprint to actually identify the source of lead because different sources of lead have different lead isotope ratios. Mark Antonio says their study found that the pr primary source of lead in most children came from dust or soil that was tracked into the house from outside, while only some came from old paint chips. But here's some more cool research going on over at Texas A&M. Another Texas A&M researcher is working on stopping a deadly superbug that the CDC has designated as one of the five most urgent threats to the U.S. healthcare system. 
The superbug is called C. difficile, and it can cause serious diarrhea. Most patients come down with a C. diff infection if they're in the hospital already. Their research has found it shares a food source with another metabolite in the gut. Now, this differs from what was originally believed about how the body protects against the superbug. If you can remove the food source, C. diff can't gain a hold uh, in, in the gut and to cause disease. Now, the, the, what, what we think is the really interesting part is that once C. diff does come in and cause disease, it also consumes that food, leading to the microbiome not being able to regenerate to cause protection. Well, C. diff causes more than 500,000 infections per year, 29,000 of which result in death. Sorek says their next step in fighting the superbug is figuring out how to ensure only the good bacteria in the gut eats that food source and preventing C. diff from consuming it. Well, the COVID-19 pandemic has led some healthcare providers to rethink how they're delivering care. Instead of patients coming to the doctor's office, they're reaching them where they live, especially in those underserved neighborhoods. Natalie Brand shows us how a special community health van is helping drive the mission by visiting popular places to make patients feel more comfortable. Drawing a crowd with good food and live music, this Maryland farmer's market also offers preventative health care on the side. All time. My Van Gora came to shop. She left with an extra shot of COVID-19 protection. I have been thinking about getting my booster for the past month, but um, this is really good. It's convenient and potentially life-saving for people who don't have easy access to a doctor's office for vaccines or routine checkups. The one thing we noticed that through the pandemic is that people stopped going to the doctor regularly and they have been recently coming to our emergency rooms for things like uncontrolled hypertension and uncontrolled diabetes. The Luminous Health team is rolling out preventative screenings with this mobile van to reach people in their communities. Healthcare provider Alexandra Moran says Emilsa Mendez hasn't seen a doctor since 2019. She has family history of both diabetes and hypertension. Mendez says it's been hard to find in-person appointments. Nelson Fleitez says language can be a barrier to visiting an office. We're not speaking good English, so it's kind of hard for us. Sometimes we not understand whatever the doctor say. The pandemic has highlighted the need to make health care more accessible. Settings like the market or a place of worship can help bridge the gap. As we've been dealing with COVID, more focus on how do we keep the population healthy. If a large segment of our population is sick, it impacts everyone. Healthcare providers say it's about building trust and getting out and into the neighborhood can make all the difference. Natalie Brandt, CBS News, Riverdale, Maryland. Well, a recent analysis of mobile health clinics nationwide found they serve an important role in reaching vulnerable populations. More than half of their patients were women and nearly a third were minorities. Well, let's take a look at some local headlines now, shall we? We're going to begin with breaking news. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office has a suspect in custody after a fatal shooting last night. The Sheriff's Office is still investigating that shooting. This morning, we don't know the identities of the suspect or the victim, but here's what we do know from the authorities. What happened about 6.40 p.m. yesterday on Valleywood Drive in Spring. When deputies arrived on scene, they found a 27-year-old man with an apparent gunshot wound. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. Investigators say the suspect and victim were former roommates. The Texas Rangers are investigating a roadside hostage situation in East Texas that ended with officers shooting an armed suspect. It's pointed at him. Yes. Yeah. Drop the gun. Drop the gun. Drop the gun. Going hard. Drop the gun. Shots fired. While authorities in Lufkin say the suspect was holding a driver at gunpoint, this started as a shots fired call but turned into a cross county chase. Two of the officers shot at the man, hitting him in the neck and the shoulder. He was treated at the hospital and taken into custody. The hostage, luckily, was not injured. 
A Navasota man is in the Brazos County Jail this morning accused of arson. Deputies from the Brazos County Sheriff's Office say he intentionally set fire to a mobile home. 41-year-old Miguel Muniz is also charged with evading arrest and criminal mischief. No word yet on why he allegedly set the home on fire. That happened yesterday in the, th in the 3000 block of Rocky Circle near Milliken. The house was destroyed, but fortunately nobody was hurt. The sheriff's office says they were at the home for a disturbance call a couple of hours before the fire was set. Hey, yesterday was election day in College Station and the results are in. College Station City Councilman will keep his seat. That's right, Dennis Maloney wins re-election in yesterday's runoff with almost 60% of the vote. Challenger David Levine received about 400 votes less. The city says election returns will be canvassed and certified next week. And Maloney will be sworn in to start his next three-year term. Well, Brazos County leaders have adopted new commissioner and justice of peace precincts. Brazos County has over 233,000 residents. That's according to the 2020 census. City leaders have worked to get precincts as even as possible with just under a 7% population difference between them. Commissioners also ensured that their precincts also match the JP and election precincts. Once you learn a precinct line, and the web no matter whether it's the JP or the commissioner or elections or whoever, once you know that the precinct line is, is one way for a, whether it's commissioner, JP, or constable, you know it's the same way. Well, commissioner and JP precincts go into effect on January 1st of 2023. Brazos County leaders have also adopted new election precincts. Brazos County has grown by more than 17%, according to the 2020 census. The number of precincts stays the same at 98. However, some changes were put into place to accommodate population growth and match state legislative house districts, commissioner and justice precincts. Some people may be getting a new card with new uh, voting precinct lines on them or new commissioner lines, you know. Uh, so all that work has to be done in the database. So that way our voters uh, will also be able to vote for who will serve them in 2023. And hey, big changes are coming to Texas A&M University and the school aims to have them done around the beginning of the next school year. President Catherine Banks issued her report on the school's comprehensive review, which outlines what some of those changes will look like. Restructuring is coming to Texas A&M. President Catherine Banks announced over 20 changes in a variety of forms to better embrace its mission. One is the formation of the College of Arts and Sciences by merging the Colleges of Liberal Arts, Geosciences, and Science. I believe together they can um, form a catalyst system that will allow them to uh, grow even more, to provide more impact, to uh, have unusual and unique educational opportunities for our students. The report also focused on faculty and a desire to remove inefficiency and excessive requirements from their processes. Banks says the creation of a new Vice President of Faculty Affairs position will allow professors to focus more on their research and teaching responsibilities. We need to enhance the faculty. We need to recognize the faculty who contribute greatly to um, both this campus and the world with groundbreaking discoveries. We need to mentor them. We don't do a very good job of mentoring our faculty. These changes also include realigning certain programs while increasing the influence of others. One of those is the Bush School, and Banks wants to expand its accessibility to undergraduate students. It is time to make the Bush School a crown jewel of, of Texas A&M University. It is, it is time for us to see the Bush School as the embodiment of selfless service on this campus. It's time to have many programs connected with the Bush School, including minors and degree programs. Well, Banks says the deadline to implement all these changes is September 1st of next year. It's also good to keep in mind that President Banks says the Board of Regents has final approval on many of these actions and further approvals will be necessary throughout the entire process. 
Well, here's a super cute story for you. It happened yesterday and some College Station students showed off their spelling abilities. 25 Spring Creek Elementary third and fourth graders competed in the school's spelling bee. The spelling bee was hosted by our very own Kathleen and Josh Ninky. The school's principal says the students prepared for about three weeks. A third grader won the spelling bee and the winning word was curtail. Dedication that they have to number one, do put the work in to study uh, and then you get up in front of the peers, like I said, and uh, with all the pressure and the challenges. Well, the winner took home a B trophy, but the principal says all the students were winners. And I actually talked to News 3's Caleb Britt, who was at the Spelling Bee. He's the one that put together that story. And he was telling me that some of the words were pretty difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know if when I was in third grade, I would have known how to spell curtail. I do know that I studied really hard. So maybe if at some point I read it, I would have known how to spell it. But even today, there are some words where I've only heard them spoken and I've never seen them. And I'm a very visual learner. So there's some times where I'm like, I know what that word is. I know what it means, but I've never seen it spelled. And then there's words that catch you every time. What is yours? A lot of people have restaurant. Mine is broccoli. Is it two C's or two L's? Even right now, I don't know. I think it's two C's. I do not know how to spell broccoli. I do, but I don't. That's the word that always gets me. Everyone always has that one word that you're like, how do you spell that again? Or you write it down and you just second guess yourself. That doesn't look right. Mine's broccoli. A big, 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 big announcement that happened yesterday. I told you a little bit about it in the morning. But we've got more details on it after yesterday. So the Fujifilm Bio Corridor is making even more space. Fujifilm says they're increasing their production space, this time with a $300 million facility expansion. News 3's Clay Falls learned the state is pitching in to bring 150 new high paying jobs right here to our community. Fujifilm Dyson Biotechnology says they will add 150 skilled positions by 2024. The company says it will expand their reach in the industry of contract development and manufacturing organization. This investment will expand our advanced therapies and vaccine manufacturing capacity and will make our Texas site the largest single-use CDMO campus in North America. These new jobs are being supported by Governor Greg Abbott through a $1.5 million enterprise fund award. Basically what the governor did was he said there's 150 jobs and the governor's enterprise fund committed $10,000 per job that's created with this new building. So that's an added incentive for Fuji to come here. College Station Mayor Carl Mooney tells us the announcement puts our bio corridor even more on the map. Even the governor's office will tell you Bryan College Station has become the bio corridor for, for the state of Texas. Matt Prohaska with the Brazos Valley Economic Development Corporation tells us the new jobs will average around $80,000 in salary. This is definitely the result of a lot of years of work, um, relationship building, and really just wonderful teamwork. In College Station, Clay Falls, News 3. Governor Abbott also said in a statement the announcement, quote, will bring more opportunities for Texans to develop life-saving technology and treatment. Well, hey, one more thing that could be coming to our community, a new internet, TV, and phone provider in Bryan is becoming closer to reality. Metronet and the city of Bryan announced the new fiber optic network is starting to be built this, work, is this month. Metronet will provide a 100% fiber network around the city. Neighborhoods are already starting to see yard flags and mailing notices about the work being done. We asked city, the city what residents and businesses can expect. They'll have, door, they'll have door hangers. They'll go door to door letting you know they're coming and uh, work with the citizens of Bryan as best they can. And we've met with them just this earlier this week. And this team that are going to be out in the field seem very energetic, very positive. They're bilingual as well. Well, residents interested in becoming a customer of Metronet can contact the company if they'd like to sign up for those services.
Some moments are meant to be immortalized, and most Aggies would agree the win over Alabama is one of them. Local artist Benjamin Knox took on that job. Kathleen Ninky takes us inside his process on today's Made in the Brazos Valley. I want to do things that are inspiring, something that really grabs people's heartstrings, really has an emotional sense to it. Artist Benjamin Knox found that emotion and so much more as he shot photos on the sideline of the Texas A&M upset over Alabama. By the time the clock hit zero, he knew he had to paint this scene. Step two. I then go through all of my photographs thinking of what is the best way to portray this? I do concept sketches, everybody jumping off running onto the field. That's the, that's the focal point. So all of the key moments in the scene rotate around that. Knox even meets with key people to make his piece personal, like the players' families. Get their input and, of course, their excitement, and that would then transcend into more um, enthusiasm in the painting, you know, the feeling comes through. Then I tone the canvas and then put in the time. So when people ask me, how long does it take a painting? Well, it's my whole life and 100 hours. This is where his training and experience kick in. So the first thing I do is accurate drawing. I want to make sure my anatomy and everything is correct. And then from there I go in and add usually the dark, backgrounds and then I paint on top of that the massing in the blocks of color. As he paints his photos become artwork and the Aggies triumph becomes a showpiece. The painting starts to see. So that's often when I'm finished is whenever what's up here is now on the page itself or canvas itself. Well the original there is quite pricey but reasonably priced professional prints are available. They do all of that in-house. And while we're talking about Texas A&M and that huge win over Alabama, I did want to mention some big news that happened yesterday. Texas A&M running back Isaiah Spiller announced he will forego his senior season at A&M and declare for the NFL draft. Spiller finished his junior year fourth in the SEC in rushing with over 1,000 yards for the second straight season. He tallied six touchdowns on the ground and one receiving TD. He's had 16 100-yard rushing games with the maroon and white, which is the most since Greg Hill in the early 90s. Spiller is just the seventh Aggie to eclipse 3,000 rushing yards for his career, and he's expected to be one, if not the first, running back selected in 2022, according to several mock drafts. We wish him the best of luck, but we will miss him. Well, big news, other big news in the sports world, and it doesn't have to do with Texas A&M. Sorry, Aggie fans, this is big news for someone else, but we'll still celebrate with him. Steph Curry is now the king of three-pointers in the NBA. Last night, the Golden State Warriors star guard knocked down his 2,974th three-pointer against the Knicks, passing Ray Allen for the crown. I got the ball coming down and I could see everybody on that end of the stadium just start to slowly stand up. The way that it happened, you know, Wiggs came off a screen, I kind of floated back to three-point line. I thought about nothing, I just let it go, and then after that, the emotion started to kick in. So I just wanted to let it come, and it was a pretty, it was a pretty special moment. Like, I shot it, I backtracked, I saw my pops over on the side, saw my teammates going crazy, felt the whole buzz of the whole arena, so it was special. If that is not a feel-good moment, I can feel the excitement. It's like I'm in the stadium with him, living these emotions. Gosh, I wish I was there. How awesome. Well, Steph Curry says he is now comfortable calling himself the greatest shooter of all time. Big shout out to Steph Curry, the NBA's record three-point shooter. Wow. All right, one funny story. Let me tell you about it. Kraft, you know Kraft, they make mac and cheese. Well, they're having trouble making enough cream cheese to keep store shelves filled this year. So the company wants to pay you to not buy it for your cheesecake. The production shortage turns promotion works like this. Participants register on a special website and then this Friday and Saturday, Kraft will pick up to 18,000 winners. 
These people will be able to submit receipts for ingredients used in some other type of holiday treat and then get reimbursed up to $20. Kraft says it saw demand for its Philadelphia cream cheese spike 18% last year because more people were baking at home. That demand remains steady throughout this year, helping to fuel the shortage that we're seeing now. Kraft says it's pumping money into production and hopes to make enough cream cheese for everyone who wants it. Well, if you eat cream cheese for Christmas, what kind do you make? What do you make it with? No, what do you use your cream cheese for? There I go. What kind of cheesecake is what I meant to say. Do you make using your Kraft cream cheese? I want to know. I love cheesecake. I love it. But I would rather get $20 for not making it. So that's kind of difficult. I don't know. Well, hey, nearly six years into a solar exploratory mission. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about space. A space probe has gotten very close to the sun, close enough, NASA says, to touch it. Jeremy Roth explains more in today's Take a Look at This. Man-made spacecraft has touched the sun. That's according to NASA, which says its Parker Solar Probe recently flew through the sun's corona, feeding back crucial data about our closest star. The probe launched in 2018 and has been hurtling toward the sun on a mission to explore its mysteries. The probe didn't actually touch the sun's surface because technically the sun doesn't have a solid surface. It reached the sun's corona, or in simpler terms, its upper atmosphere. Or in even simpler terms, the wispy yellow thingy seen here. As it entered the corona, the probe fed back images of streams of plasma that surrounded the spacecraft, as well as collecting samples of particles and magnetic fields there. This is a huge milestone. It took us over six decades to come to this point. NASA researchers say this is just the first of many planned Parker flybys. The probe will continue orbiting over the next several years, bringing it millions of miles even closer to the sun. You gotta love science, am I right? Just look at this amazing video captured by researchers aboard a deep sea vessel off the coast of California of a freaky fish that can see through its own forehead. The six inch barrel eye fish, or Macropenna microstoma, lives at a depth of roughly 2,000 feet and can rotate its eyes upward to see through transparent tissue on its head and track its prey stealthily from below. See what I mean? Science! Or take a look at this. I'm Jeremy Roth. Pretty darn cool. Science, am I right? Gotta love science and especially outer space. So cool. All right, y'all. Well, we're just about at that time for our KBTX newscast at noon. We've got more holiday related stories after the break. So if you want to come join me at 1230 for some more feel good stories and some more holiday related stories, we're going to talk you know, a little bit about a toy drive happening and a very special visit from Santa Claus. All right. So Come back at 1230. I'll be here. You know where to find me, KBTX YouTube Live, or KBTX app, or any of our streaming services. So I'll be back here at about 1230. I'll see you guys then.
All right, folks, it's 1230, which means we are back here on News 3 Now. Hope you enjoyed the last 30 minutes of your day, whether you got outside and went for a walk, ate some lunch, or just sat there waiting for me to come back. Regardless of what you did, I hope you're having a great day. It's Wednesday. We're all about halfway through our Wednesday, in fact, which means we're going to see that downward slope into the weekend. We can do this, y'all. We're halfway through another week. Christmas is in sight. Michael Buble and Mariah Carey are officially defrosted. They're singing. Snow is falling. Not here, but other places it is. Let's do a quick recap of some of the things we talked about, and then we'll talk about some cute holiday stories, and then I'll let you be on your way for the rest of your Wednesday. Sound good? All right. So first and foremost, if you were not tuning in at 11 o'clock this morning, I want to talk to you about some of the resources that are available over at the Brazos Valley Council of Governments. If you haven't been there, go check it out. Every time I have been there, I have met someone that is incredible and someone that really wants to serve the community and is passionate about helping people. That's exactly what they do. There are resources, programs, organizations available over there to help you with whatever you need. So today we talked to Hank. He works for the Aging and Disability Resource Center over at BB Cog. If you need to make a decision for an aging old, uh, an aging loved one, a disabled loved one, you need to make an informed decision. You need some resources for them, whether they need meals delivered, whether they need, you know, uh, financial assistance, utility assistance, whatever it is, that is the place to go, the Aging and Disability Resource Center. You can find them over at BVCOG. I'm going to have more information up on our KBTX website later this afternoon. And listen up, if you work in the service industry, arts and entertainment, food, hotels, retail, service industry peeps, if you lost your job or even if you didn't, if you're struggling because of the pandemic and you can't afford childcare, but you'd like to get back to work, there's a program for you, SIR. It's the Service Industry Recovery Program. It just started over at BVCOG and Workforce Solutions, and it's going to help you by giving you the chance to have 12 months of free childcare. They have the funding. They have the resources. They just need you to sign up. There's applications online. Again, I will have that up for you on kbtx.com. So that's what we started our day with. Then we know that President Biden traveled to Mayfield, Kentucky today to talk with some officials in Kentucky about the damage after the deadly tornadoes. Now he will remain in Kentucky for quite a few hours today. And of course, back to the White House he goes. Now, one more thing we're monitoring right now is whether or not the Department of Justice will hold former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt. The House voted late last night to uh, vote for him to be in contempt of Congress, which means that the final decision now goes to the Department of Justice. We also know that late last night, the Senate passed the debt limit. They raised it by two and a half trillion dollars and we know that majority leader chuck schumer said that that should last us until after next year's midterm elections we know the treasury secretary was warning that the united states could default on the national debt limit as soon as today so with just a few hours to go they did pass that raising the debt limit we also know that the Pfizer's COVID-19 pill to help folks who have been d diagnosed with COVID-19 and have early symptoms is now on its way to the FDA for approval. Now, the FDA advisory committee that makes the final decision to grant authorization of that pill has not set a date yet to do so, though. We also know that new survey shows that almost 1 million COVID-19 deaths were prevented because of the vaccine. No matter which vaccine you got, vaccines are our best defense against the COVID-19 virus. Yesterday was uh, election day in College Station, or re-election day, should I call it, because Dennis Maloney, longtime council member, re-elected to his seat, city council place six, that is now next week. Maloney will be sworn in for his next full three-term year. 
As something exciting that happened last night in the sports world, Steph Curry became the NBA's record holder three-point shooter. He made a record number of three-point shots last night. Remember, he plays for the Golden State Warriors. They had a game, and he now feels confident calling himself the NBA's best shooter of all time. Well-deserved, I'd have to say. Uh, one more thing that we're looking at is there is a cream cheese shortage. Yep, you heard me correctly. Kraft, Kraft Mac and Cheese Company, you've heard of them. Kraft is actually going to pay people not to buy cream cheese to make a cheesecake this year so that people who want to put cream cheese on their bagels can do so. Basically, they're saying if you keep your receipt and prove that you didn't buy cream cheese to make your cheesecake and show them the receipt with uh, you know, other stuff that you made. Maybe you made an apple pie instead. They will reimburse you up to $20. Pretty cool. Well, hey, let's talk a couple for a couple minutes about some Christmas stories and then I'll let you be on your way for the rest of the Wednesday. A local fitness studio here in town is collecting toys that will soon be distributed for Christmas. The Cycle Station on Texas Avenue in College Station is currently collecting new toys that will be donated to the nonprofit group BCS Together. In addition to collecting toys, friends Jill Fouch and Lauren Puente recently gave away 60 holiday hams to some local families. Well, just so you know, the toy drive ends on Thursday. That's tomorrow. So if you have a gift for a 6 to 10-year-old, you can drop it off at the Cycle Station. They're on Texas Avenue next to Barnes & Noble. And heads up, folks, today is the last day you can use regular USPS retail ground shipping for your packages to arrive by Christmas. It's also the last day for most ground services through FedEx. For UPS, December 21st is its deadline for the three day select service when shipping in the United States. For FedEx Express, you can buy yourself a little bit more time. You can get same day delivery through the 24th, but hey, unless you want to shell out the big bucks for overnight or rush delivery, get on it, y'all. All right, I've got our last story of the day here, and ooh, it is a good one. Two-year-old Cade got an early visit from Santa Claus who waved up to him in his hospital window. Check this out. Are you excited? Santa's waving at you. Are you telling him you want a bike? Gotta love it. Shout out to Santa Claus. All right, I've got our last, I know I said that was the last story, but this is a good one. This is what I'm gonna have you end our day with. This is what I'm leaving you with. It's really cute. It's a golden retriever smiling. All right, this is our last story of the day. Are you happy? Joey, you're the 
All right. If that's not cute and made your day, I don't know what will. That's what we're ending our day with today. Thanks for tuning in to News 3 Now on this Wednesday, December 15th. Halfway through another week, Christmas is just around the corner. We're 10 days away. Remember, get those holiday gifts sent. Deadlines are today, tomorrow, and coming up. But you don't want to pay the big bucks for that rush shipping. So get them in now, y'all. Merry early Christmas. We've been talking about Christmas. We're going to continue to talk about Christmas because it's the most wonderful time of the year. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your Wednesday. I'll see you tomorrow right here on News 3 Now on KBTX YouTube. And hey, I'm going to have those resources and some links up for Brazos Valley Council of Governments on KBTX.com later this afternoon. And if you need this reminder today and every single day, don't forget... You are loved, and I'm happy that you're here.